Live Free Church, we're empowering people to live a life of freedom through Jesus Christ. So, get ready to hear a life-changing and life-empowering message from Pastor Terrell Taylor. Uh, before we pray, uh, I just have a little story I'd like to share. Um, you know, there's this story about a woman who, uh, she goes to the doctor and, uh, you know, who verifies that she is pregnant. And uh, this is her first pregnancy. And the doctor asks her if she has any questions. Uh, well, she replies, uh, well, I I'm a little worried about the pain, okay? How much will childbirth hurt? The doctor answered, well, that varies from woman to woman and pregnancy to pregnancy. And besides, it's difficult to describe the pain. Uh, I know, but can't you give me some idea, she asks. Okay, says the doctor. Grab your upper lip and pull it out a little, okay? You don't have to try this right now. but you. So he says, grab your upper lip and pull it out a little. Like this, a little more. Okay, like this, no, a little more. And then she says, like this, and the doctor says, yes. And then he says, does that hurt? She says, well, a little bit. He says, now stretch it over your head. That's how childbirth feels. <laughs> Matter of fact, my wife gave birth to three sons. Our first son was nine pounds, seven and a half ounces. That was Trevor, TNT. And then his, here comes Travis at nine pounds and seven ounces. And then not to be outdone by his older brothers, little Trenton comes along, and he's 11 pounds and six ounces. So, my wife, you are my shero. Amen. I did the small work. You did the big work. You did the labor. Okay. I, so anyway, let me move on. So thanks again for all you amazing women. Let's pray. God, we thank you for uh, this day together, Lord, in the house of God and online and, and our guests and our, our visitors as well. And, Lord, we pray that, uh, Lord, that today's uh, sermon message, Lord, would, would resonate and just encourage and bless. Lord, as we are studying the parables of Jesus, may we be reminded of how you want us to live and how the kingdom operates. And for that, we are grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are continuing our series uh, on the parables of Jesus, and, and today we're going to talk about workers in the vineyard and the fair employer. Everybody say, workers in the vineyard and the fair employer. Come on, say it like you mean it. Workers in the vineyard and the fair employer. Now, the reality of God, we understand the reality of God is revealed in word pictures of a parable. You know, on the one hand, in, in finite terms, God is beyond human comprehension, all right? God is beyond you. He's beyond me, right? He's beyond human comp uh, comprehension. And, uh, but on the other hand, his infinite majesty may be captured in vivid stories of daily life. Right, so, so in order to understand the unknown spiritual world, we must first take a look at the known natural world. The Hebrew word for parable is mashal, and it defines the unknown by using what is known. That is the Hebrew understanding of a parable. You use what is known to define the unknown. And the Greek word for parable, paraboble, uh, refers to a teaching aid cast alongside the truth being taught. So the Greeks have an understanding of a parable being a, a comparing something to something else, right? It's a comparison of one thing with another. So we understand that Jesus is the master storyteller. Jesus loves to use miniature plays to communicate his message. And the way the parables speak about God is deeply rooted in the historical and cultural background of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, many of you know that I love studying Jewish culture and the culture of, of the Bible because it helps us uh, with more insight and understanding of what was going on back then. So, so there's a lot of cultural background that is taking place 
place. And it's interesting to note this as well, that one-third of the recorded sayings of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are in parables. One-third of the recording sayings of Jesus are parables. So I want you to, to write this down. Listen, parables are a shadow of the substance, all right? And we'll leave that up there for just a moment. Parables are a shadow of the substance. It's the physical reality, right? The physical reality of the parable reveals the connection of our world and the spiritual dimension. Leave that up for just a moment, okay? Again, parables are a shadow of what? The substance. It's just a shadow. The physical reality of the parable reveals the connection of our world, the world that we see, the world that we can touch, right? The world that we identify, but it connects our world and there's a, a dimension that is beyond what you see. Matter of fact, last Sunday in a time of praise and worship, one of our members actually saw an angel come in the room, and I'm going to have her share that uh, soon. Uh, I've been in other church services where people have seen angels. Now listen, if the Bible says they exist, then they exist. Now, whether you've seen one or not doesn't prove that, the, that there's a, doesn't prove that they don't exist, right? And, and I remember, too, being in a service where I literally felt it was in worship, and I felt a brush go across my face. I was on the floor. It was a big conference, and, and I was on the floor, and a brush went across my face, and I literally felt a brush like a wind, and then it felt like wings. And when I got up, someone said, listen, and they didn't know me from anything. They said, listen, what you felt on your face were angels' wings. I'm not making this stuff up. There's a true spiritual dimension. And so the purpose of the parables of Jesus, what? They are to instruct, illustrate, and teach powerful spiritual lessons for everyday kingdom living. Anybody living in the kingdom today? Do I have any kingdom men in the house today? Do I have any kingdom women in the house today? Well, Jesus is going to instruct us on how to uh, live in the kingdom way and to understand how the kingdom works. Now, Jesus, again, like I said, he is the master of parables because he is the master of life. Somebody say amen right there. That was a good spot for you to say amen. Jesus is the master of parables because he is the master of life. Everything that we see and don't see was created by him, through him, Paul says. The Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit, right? And so in this story that I'm going to share today, it's a shocking story that Jesus told the crowd. And, and the parable of the workers in the vineyard and the fair employer illustrates the divine character of God. God is like the gracious and generous landowner who hires workers for his vineyard. This lengthy parable is found only in the gospel of Matthew. And Jesus tells this parable in response to uh, Peter's uh, question in Matthew 19 and 27. This is what Peter says. He says, we have left everything to follow you. When then, what then will there be for us? That's Peter's asking Jesus, what's, gonna, what's, what's in it for me? <laughs> Anybody ever ask that, what's in it for me, right? I know I have. Come on, y'all. I know y'all spiritual on Mother's Day, but anybody ask, what's in it for me? Thank you. Now I can move on. Amen. Sometimes y'all like to leave the pastor hanging. So Peter says, what's in it for me, right? Peter wanted to know what reward would be given to those who give up everything to follow Jesus. So, in response, Jesus explains this truth about the kingdom of heaven. Now, the crucial issues raised in this dramatic presentation surround these questions. And the questions are these, what is just and fair? And then number two, what is God like? 
And then the third question is, in what ways do God's servants resemble him and reflect the divine character in their relationships with others? These are the three questions that Jesus is going to bring up in this parable. What is just and fair? What is God like? And how is our relationships with one another? All right. So listen to this story as as I just want you to to take yourself uh, back in the day uh, over 2000 years ago and, and you're in the crowd, and Jesus says this, and Jesus says, let me tell you about the way God's kingdom works. It's like the employer in this story. A man owned a vineyard and needed some laborers to come and work in the vineyard. So he went to the marketplace early in the morning to find some workers, He found workers, some workers eager to find work in those early hours, and he invited them to come work for him. Before they started working, they agreed. Somebody say they agreed. They agreed upon a fair wage. Matter of fact, it was about $65, all right, for the day's work. They immediately began doing the work the employer had hired them to do. This is early in the morning, around 6 a.m., 7 a.m. Now, around 9 a.m., he went back to the marketplace, saw some people standing around, and invited them to go to work in his vineyard. He told them, I'll pay you what is right for your labor. So these people went and got to work. Then at noon and at 3 p.m. and at 5 p.m., he did the same thing each time, finding some lazy folks standing around. (laughs) He asked them, why have you spent the day just standing around? Because no one has hired us, they replied. Now, the owner of the vineyard had been there earlier, and surely word had gotten out that he was hiring. But nonetheless, he invited them to go to work as well. So now, the end of the day, it's 6 p.m., When it was 6 p.m., the owner of the vineyard gathered the workers and began to pay them for their labor. He started with those who he had hired at the end of the day. He started with those who had worked at 5, who started work at 5 p.m. He pulled out $65 and handed it to those who had only worked for one hour. He did the same with the workers who worked for three hours, six hours, and and nine hours. Now, each group of workers started grumbling more than the last. Somebody said, let's get ready to grumble. So they started grumbling and complaining more than the group before them, seeing that everyone was getting the same wage, regardless of how long they worked. Now, when those who had worked since before 9 in the morning came to receive their wage, they spoke up and said, this is not fair. You've paid equally to those who only worked a little bit, and we worked all day long through the scorching heat. (laughs) And this is what the landowner replied. He said, friend, am I not doing right by you? You are getting what you agreed to work for, $65. But I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. It's my money after all. Oh, I like that. I I like folks who try to tell you what to do with your money. (laughs) And the employer says, it is my money after all. Don't I have the right to do what I want with it? What is it to you if I choose to be generous with my money? Now, some of you are thinking right now, how, how you know, you, you, some of you put yourself in, some of y'all were the ones who were complaining. I just feel it in the spirit right now. Right? Some people earn $65 an hour while others only were uh, earned $6.50 an hour in this store. Now, that's a big difference for the same kind of work. This is a very interesting story because first of all, the story attempts to imagine God in his immeasurable goodness and generosity. Second, the story focuses attention on the welcome of the latecomers into the community of faith, into the kingdom of God. 
Now, if you're like me, we want to identify ourselves, right, with those workers who are very responsible. We were, we were there looking uh, for work early in the morning. I know some of us in this story, we were the ones there at 6 a.m. Now, some of you in this story, y'all didn't show up till 5, but God bless you. Amen. You, you, you work in the evening time. We understand. <laughs> But, 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 yeah, there were workers there all day, and, and, and you know, the, the workers there that were all day, they were saying, listen, we were hungry, and we were thirsty, and, and at least, listen, we're going to get, we should get paid per hour that we worked. We stood in line. We worked, right? We, we, we agreed, I know, but, man, God, really, you gave the same amount to the others as you gave to me. You know, we, we immediately begin to do the math in our head when we think about the, the difference in wages. We think to ourselves, well, listen, I, if I'm going to be upset, I've, I've got a reason because, you know, if I showed up at 6 a.m., literally, or even 7, then I should have gotten $585. That's what our thinking is, right? In fact, we start to think about what we have coming to us. We actually deserve, right, more than what we agreed to. And if that's what the owner pays for only one hour of work, then I should really be getting paid. <laughs> but in the time we're standing in that line, right, everything changes. We're no longer grateful for our wage. We're no longer grateful for what we agreed to work. Listen, we now are mad. These early workers are livid. <laughs> Not only are we mad at the landowner, but we are also resentful of those other workers who we deem to be lazy. We resent those other people who came late in the game, and they're getting the same amount we are. And we're crying out, it's just not fair. Well, let's turn to the Bible and read it for ourselves. Matthew, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 12. And, 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 and so we're going to read it. I, I gave you kind of the story in advance. But listen, we're going to read what it says. And it's out of the New International Version. It says, for the kingdom of heaven. Remember, we're talking about kingdom living. Amen. Matthew 20, verse 1 through 12. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About 9 in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right so they went he went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing about five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around he asked them why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing somebody probably said I was on my iPhone that I can't afford Verse 7, because no one has hired us, they answered. And then the employer said to them, he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. Verse 8, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired. Make note of that. Beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came, and they each received a denarius. Verse 10. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected. Listen, this is an expectation. They what? Expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Though uh, These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them, and this is the thing right here, you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of work and the heat of the day. And you talk about a shocking story. <laughs> I think it's still shocking some of us today. <laughs> and, and so I, wanted, uh, I want you to understand what's going on during this time. Now, planting and maintaining and harvesting vineyards in the first century Israel, it was strenuous work. 
requiring hard physical labor in the heat of the summer. Often additional day laborers were required to get all of the work done. And as a result of heavy taxation and, and high debt, you remember the, the, the Jews were occupied. Uh, Rome had occupied uh, Israel, right? And so there was a lot of heavy taxation. Matter of fact, Matthew, who is the writer of the Gospel of Matthew, he was a tax collector, the most despised of Jews among all Jews. So there was a lot of heavy taxation and and high debt and scarce resources, right? So laborers in the time of Jesus, they were forced to hire themselves out on a daily basis. Only the, the, the truly fortunate had more permanent means of employment, now, the owner of this particular vineyard, he went again to the, to the marketplace around 6 a.m. to find workers for the day. And he offered uh, the wage of one denarius. Now, the, a denarius was equal to a Roman soldier's pay for a day. Right? It was, it, it was equal. So, so basically, this landowner was being generous from the beginning. <laughs> I remember when I was, uh, uh, back in 1995, I was traveling with a music group from our, our college, Oral Roberts University, and we were all over the, the U.S., and then we went over to Russia, and uh, we were there for about uh, 10 days or so. And, and I remember that when we were touring the city, uh, some uh, Russian uh, policemen came up to us, and they were asking us what we were doing, and we were telling them we're, we're a music group and we're from the U.S., and then they began to complain They said, do you realize that your police officers in the United States make about 10 times as much as we make over here? They barely pay us over here. And they were just sharing how how hard it was over there. This was not long after, you know, the collapse of USSR and, and the economy was still trying to get going and all that. But I'll never forget that. They were very upset because of the difference between police officers in America and police officers over there. But in this story, of course, the, the, the landowner, he's being generous. He's giving these workers uh, uh, the pay, the same pay as a Roman soldier. And those who worked in this story for one hour, we all know, received the same pay as those who worked for nine hours. Now, some of you, I want you to go to your job tomorrow and tell your boss that you'll work nine hours more without any pay. Come on. And somebody do that. Somebody say, no, I ain't going to do that, Pastor. No, no my employer going to pay me. <laughs> But they did receive the same pay. All were made equals. Now, someone says, is that just? Is that fair? We live in a culture and a society where everybody wants to say what's just and what's fair. So, yeah, this story is asking that question. But this parable teaches what is fair. Listen, God's grace is given in equal measure to all of his workers. Regardless of the time put in, God's grace is given equally. And that is exactly what Jesus wanted to get across to the people of of this time. The kingdom of God is not a kingdom based on earthly standards. It is based on heavenly standards. That's the difference between kingdom people and just church people. Church people are too caught up in earthly standards of living. And when you get around somebody who's a kingdom-minded, kingdom-living person, there's a difference, amen, because there's some devils up in the church. Listen, I'm a church baby, and I can talk about it. There were some devils growing up in my church, amen. But but there's a difference between kingdom living and and earthly standards. And so Jesus is telling us this parable for those reasons. It is not a place, listen, where you earn certain rewards depending upon how long you've served God. Listen to this, and it's on your screen. The kingdom of God is built upon what? The principles of grace, generosity, justice, and fairness. Say that with me again. The kingdom of God 
is built upon the principles of grace, generosity, justice, and fairness. That's the kingdom. And, and by the way, there's only one king. Well, God, I don't agree with, well, he's the king. <laughs> Jesus, I am, well, he's the king. So the setting in life, again, for this parable, it reflects, uh, it, it all, all, almost reminds us of the time we're living in during this pandemic. There's a depressed economic conditions, right? And, and there's depressed economic conditions in the daily marketplace. A denarius was sufficient to provide food for the laborer and his family. But the day laborer is on the bottom of the economic ladder. Listen, these people who are having to find work every day, they are on the bottom of the economic ladder. The parable does not mention the harvest, but actions of the landowner who hires workers all day long. This would suggest the urgency of harvesting the crop. Harvest time work in a vineyard is toilsome, manual labor. Listen, I don't even like to get in my yard to cut grass. I can't imagine trying to do the harvest stuff back then. <laughs> and the reason I don't cut grass is because I'm allergic. That's what I tell my wife. I'm allergic. I'm, I'm, I'm allergic to her. I've been allergic to the grass all my life. Amen. But it was, it was manual uh, labor. It was toilsome. And, and the urgency, though, of the harvest made each hour crucial. One day too late and the crop, the whole crop may be lost. One day too early may not return a profit to the owner. So this landowner was really serious about his business. And so the wealthy landowner monitors the process very closely, and he hires laborers accordingly. Unfortunately, there is a labor dispute in the workplace <laughs> between the landowner and those early day workers for what seems like an injustice. There's a labor dispute over what seems like unfairness and in equality. Well, let's look at verse 13 through 16. Jesus uh, shows us, he says, but he answered one of them, listen, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. Get on out my face. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you, listen to this, envious because I am generous? Verse 16, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Doesn't God's generosity towards the latecomers, it, it surprises me. I'm sure it surprises you too. You know, by raising the issue of divine justice and, and, and giving fair compensation, Jesus forces the listeners to evaluate their own relationships with other people. Is it fair to pay the latecomers the same wage? In the context of Jewish theology, all are rewarded justly because of their obedience rather than job performance. Whoa. Man, you mean to tell me in the kingdom, if, if we're all obedient, man, we're all going to experience heaven together? Yes. It's not based upon your performance. And so the conflict in this parable centers on the fair wages uh, paid to all the workers in according with their agreement. Now, after the first workers saw the generosity of the landowner, they naturally thought that they would receive more. But instead, the first are last, right? And the last are first. They are angry about money and the generosity of the landowner. Now, I want to tell you this. In, in a kingdom perspective, the first laborers should have been happy about the blessing of their co-workers. That's, those, those are people with a kingdom mindset. Those people with a kingdom mindset are, are, are excited and happy because of the generosity of the owner who would now have enough provision, right? He, remember, it was this $65 a day that would allow these day wages to take care of their families. 
It provided for their families, but instead they grumble and complain about their wages and they are envious of the others. When God blesses others, listen, what is your attitude? Oh, it's quiet. Is it quiet online? Because it is quiet in this house. When God blesses other people, what is your attitude? When God blesses someone with a new home, what is your attitude? When God blesses someone with a new car, what is your attitude? attitude maybe it's maybe it's a spouse maybe you're single and one of your friends is getting engaged what is your attitude <laughs> maybe it's a new job maybe it's a promotion listen we've got to make sure that our attitudes are kingdom attitudes when i see people bless i rejoice amen and I know initially sometimes in, in the inner core of, of our cells are like, oh, man, why, 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 why am I not getting a new house? Maybe because your credit is bad. Why ain't I getting a new car? Maybe because you missed two payments on the car you have. Come on, let's keep it real church people. Amen. I mean kingdom people. I mean. So listen, you don't know what other, what other people have to do in order to receive what God is blessing them with. Some people have worked so hard and some people have never given up and some people keep, keep staying in the race, amen, and then you start to see the blessing. Some people are generous just like God. Let me, let me encourage you. And if you're stingy, oh man, don't expect God just to bless you because he's not stingy. Some of y'all got the stingy spirit. I'm going to talk about it in just a moment. I'm getting there. Amen. I'm getting there. Now listen, Jesus, according to Jesus, the landowner is, he's fair. He is fair, right? He is a fair employer. He gave the first group of employees what they agreed to at the beginning of the day and compensated the latecomers with more than they expected. This parable illustrates the power and the authority of the owner of the vineyard. The owner is just, the owner is fair, the owner is gracious, and the owner is generous. That's the kind of God we serve. Somebody give God a hand praise, amen. He's a just God. He's a fair God. He's a gracious God. He is a generous God. So now I want for, for one moment, we're going to look back at verse 15 uh, in the same chapter, uh, uh, chapter 20 of Matthew. And we're going to look at this verse. I want to look at it in the King James Version translation because it's going to show us something. There's a couple things I want you to understand. And it says this again. Is it not lawful, and this is the, the words of the, the landowner, is it not lawful for me to do what I want with my own? Is thine eye what? Somebody talk to me. Is thine eye evil because I am good? Wow, that's the King James. I wanted to bring that out because first the landowner describes the attitude of the first workers by saying what? They have an evil eye. Some of y'all, you, you can picture Captain Hook, okay? You got one of them eyes is as evil, right? <laughs> you have an evil eye? That term in the Hebrew. It refers to stinginess. Woo! It's time I say it's tight, but it's right. It's tight. It's tight, but it's right. The Hebrew concept of an evil eye means that you are stingy. S T A N G Y, stingy. It refers to stinginess, which carries a certain measure. Listen, to get this. If you're a stingy in the Hebrew culture, it carries a measure of shame. On the other hand, generosity is a virtue that is highly esteemed among the Jews. That's why even when you read your Bible, even in the Old Testament, hospitality was at the highest of, of, of all things that you can do. Because why? Because their father Abraham was considered the father, not only the father of the faith, but he was the father of hospitality. 
You read about Abraham and he's sitting in his tent and people are going by and he just has his tent and he's like, oh, come on, let me, let me make a meal for you. Let me invite you to my tent and tell you about God. Woo. So it started with Abraham. And so this culture, it reveres people who are hospitable, people who are generous. And so the landowner says, listen, because you have an evil eye, because you are stingy, listen, that doesn't mean I'm going to be stingy. (laughs) I have a good eye. And we know the opposite of an evil eye is a good eye. The opposite of stinginess is generosity. So the the owner is saying, I have a generous and benevolent spirit, right? With the stingy attitude of the first laborers who refuse to rejoice in the good fortune, he is saying, listen, I am not like you. (laughs) Aren't you glad God is not like us? Hallelujah. The landowner who has a good eye, he, he is benevolent. And the early workers, on the other hand, they, they, they are envious and they are ungenerous. And they cannot stand that he has given the same amount to those other workers. It seems that the words of the landowner also make a strong contrast between what belongs to him and what belongs to the disgruntled worker. Psalm 24 and 1 says, The earth is what the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Somebody say, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. See, you, you thought that that little money you get, right, every other week or so, it belongs to you. Oh, oh I, I'm here to tell you, it really belongs to Daddy. Abba, I, I will be more uh, Abba Father. My wife and my sons make fun of me when I say Daddy, so I'll say Abba. Abba Father. It really means Daddy God. And, and so here, he is like, listen, everything In this world, including you, it belongs to me. And and when we understand that, we are blessed, right? Because God chooses to be generous with his blessings. Our Father chooses to be generous with the gift of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? He invites us to come work and to bring his kingdom to the world. So no matter how long or how hard a believer works during his or her lifetime, guess what? The reward of eternal life will be the same for all. An eternity of blessedness in heaven in the presence of God and the Father and Jesus Christ. That is the main point of this story. Listen, there's going to be people coming into the kingdom a little bit late in the game. But guess what? They're going to get to experience eternal life just as we are. And because our God is God, he has the right to invite people to join him in his kingdom and to reward them generously if they respond to the invitation of salvation. Regardless of how long or or how much work they do. Remember the thief on the cross in Luke the 23rd chapter, uh, verses 42 through 43. Remember what the thief said. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. See, some some people get mad on the thief on the cross, <laughs> right? This thief whose life of service was, was, was limited to a moment of repentance and confession of faith in Jesus. He received the same reward of eternal life that Peter, James, and John, and, and Matthew, and Bartholomew, and Judas all received. Now, the, the right Judas, not the Judas is scary. There were two Judases. I was just testing you. I was testing you. He received the same eternal reward. And of course, you know, we understand that Scripture teaches that there are different rewards in heaven based upon our, our different services. But the ultimate reward of eternal life is equally achieved by all those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. 
So in my conclusion, the, 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 I, want, I want you to really understand this because we, we are in a time where we need to be sharing the good news. We are in a time where we need to let our coworkers know about Jesus. We, and I'm not just saying invite them to live free church. I'm telling you, tell them about Jesus. Amen? Tell your unsaved family members about Jesus. We have an amazing outreach uh, ministry, and Pastor Laura and her team, they do an amazing job when we have our outreaches to our community, our back-to-school and, and our Christmas outreaches. We're going to do a Thanksgiving outreach this year, amen. And we're, we're now we're writing cards to those who are uh, uh, in, in rehab and, and senior living homes, amen. We're reaching out to those loving on our community. And so we need to share the love and the grace of Jesus. I'm not, telling you, I'm not telling you to share your political view with people. I'm not telling you to share, hey man, everything is about you. No, share about Jesus. It's okay to share your story, but it's always got to line up with who Jesus is because without his story, we wouldn't even have a story. Jesus is who he says he is. And we cannot be intimidated in in a time of a culture and a society that wants to intimidate us out of our spirituality. I'm going to look the devil and all his minions in the face and tell him I'm a Jesus lover. I'm a Jesus follower. And I'm going to serve Jesus to the day I die. Why? Because Jesus is who he says he is. And my wife doesn't like me saying this, but Jesus is either a liar and the biggest con artist we ever know, or he is who he says he is. I know it makes some people uncomfortable. Oh, Jesus is a liar. What I'm saying is you're either going to believe him or you're not. And we are either going to share him or we're going to, to, to be ashamed of him. And what does Jesus say? If you're ashamed of me before men, guess what? I am going to be shame on you in front of the angels. That's his words. I would admonish you while we're in this series on parables to study. Start reading about the parables. Start reading more of the words of Jesus and praying as you read the words of Jesus in the gospel of John and Matthew and Mark. And listen, because what Jesus is saying is paramount. He is the living Torah. He is the living word that came to give the full expression to everything else leading up to him. Jesus is a, he's a main man. He's my main man, the master of all. And so the Jewish theological concept of grace, and I'm concluding right now, listen to this. The concept of grace in in Jewish understanding, it, it means God's unmerited and undeserved favor. And this undeserved favor can be seen in this parable. We are challenged right, to follow his example. God is fair. God is just. And this story tells us about God and his unlimited grace for every person. Such a teaching is revolutionary when you think, uh, think about it, especially, right, when, when I think about how we sometimes as the disciples of Christ, we are called, right, we are called to be the representatives of God's kingdom here on the earth. Paul calls us ambassadors of Christ. But unfortunately, sometimes we love people uh, according to our own standards. We want to love people who deserve it or whom we think will give us something in return. But if I understand this parable right, if I understand this story right, generosity with restrictions does not represent the way of God's kingdom. If I want to truly represent God here on the earth, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to be generous with my time. I'm going to be generous with my talents and the gifts God has given me. I'm going to be uh, generous with my treasure, the money and the finances. Amen. And you all know here we teach the principle of tithing. That, uh, That started way back with Abraham. 
And the Jews practice it to this day. They give away 10% of their income to charitable causes. And so being generous with our time and and serving, right, and and with our talents and and being a blessing. Uh, Man, I have the greatest neighbor that I've uh, I've ever had in my life. He lives across the street from me. And, and he does some things for me. He watches for, out for me and my family when we're gone and picks up my mail. He is the man. And I tell him this all the time. You are the best neighbor. I don't know if I prayed you here or not, but you're here now. Praise God. And, and, he, and, and I'm telling you, he's a servant and he serves and he loves people. Generous. You know, that's the kind of people that I like to hang out with. People who don't mind hanging out and, and spending time. Now, listen, I, I, I'm a, I work hard, but, man, I also like to play hard. I like to hang out and I like to laugh. I like to get on the basketball court and, and hang out with my brothers like Bobby and Lee and show them how to play basketball. No, they showing me, right? My nephew, Ken, Kendrick, he's like, no, no, Pastor, no. You know you, you know you be struggling out there. I'm out there for the exercise. That's what it is. But that is kingdom living, people. Being generous like our God is generous. Loving people who's unlovable. Reaching out and and, and helping people, amen, who you don't think might deserve it. But guess what? They were created in God's image, amen, created by God. How much more are we to be the hands of God for them? Sometimes, right, it will seem like it's foolish, to be like our Heavenly Father. Sometimes it, it won't make sense to love someone who seems to be unlovable. But the kingdom of God is not only based upon justice and fairness, amen, uh, and those things, amen, they, they make sense many times because we know what is right and what is just and what is fair, but we have to understand that our Heavenly Father's kingdom is also based upon His grace, His love, and His generosity. Those things that go beyond our limited understanding. Each one of us is really the character in this story. That gets the full wage for doing only an hour's worth of work. We get more than we deserve. And so each of us has plenty of reasons to worship God with thanksgiving. And to offer that same grace, love, and generosity to others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are the ones in this story who receive more than we deserve. We thank you for your grace. Lord, when we were unlovable, you still loved us. Lord, when we went astray, You still came after us. And there might be some running right now who are watching or who are here today. And God, your grace never stops pursuing them. Your love never stops pursuing. And so, God, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your generosity. Help us be the kind of kingdom people, Lord, who rejoice like the angels rejoice when we see one sinner come to repentance. Help us rejoice, Lord, when we see others achieving in life and being blessed with things. Lord, help us rejoice with our brothers and our sisters and those, Lord, that we are in contact with. Let us not be people with an evil eye people who are stingy, people who are just trying to hold on to everything because we're, we're afraid of what the future might hold. No, Lord, you want us to give. You want us to be generous. You want us to be loving and caring. And we understand, God, that comes with proper boundaries. But, Lord, you want us to have your heart. And I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord. I pray, God, that they would understand how much you love them, how much you care, how much of a great God and generous God you are. May we reflect you, Heavenly Father. 
may we reflect you each and every day when we come in contact with others. There's a lot of hatred and anger and animosity in our society. But Lord, as kingdom people, you've called us to be different. You've called us above the politics. You've called us above, Lord, the narrative that's being painted each and every day on the news media outlets. Lord, listen, uh, your kingdom is not a kingdom of fear, hatred, and unforgiveness. Your kingdom is a kingdom of faith, love, and forgiveness. May we be those same people. And as we see ourselves in this story, God, we are going to rejoice with those that are coming into the kingdom, God. Use us, use us, God. Use us to share the good news of Jesus. Use us to give hope to a dying world. Use us, Lord God, to bring people into the kingdom of God. And we want to remind you that we exist for how many reasons? Man, somebody say five. 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 Say it like you know it. How many reasons? Let's say it together. We exist to what? Worship God with passion and expression like Pastor Lou and Sabrina Reynolds. To share the good news of Jesus with others like Pastor Tyrone. Come on, somebody. And what else? To connect with other believers in meaningful relationships like Pastor Lord, Pastor of Souls. She just be connecting with people. Amen. What else do we what else do we exist for? Power leaders to fulfill their God-given destiny and to prepare disciples to impact present day culture. Let's give God a hand praise for Live Free Church. We will see you next week. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed today's message and pray that you experience the freedom God has for you through his son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 8 verse 36 says, if the son gives you freedom, you are free. If you would like more information about Live Free Church, please visit us on the web at www.livefreechurch.org.